Uh, can we cut off? I guess we can cut off just the first row, can't we? Oh, there's a switch back there. There's a switch back You know what? I, th I think it'll be okay. Yeah, we'll just go for it. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. <laughs> Okay, well, it looks like it's right about 9.45, so we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like we're, uh, we're standing room only back there, so if you do have some chairs next to you, if you would squeeze in just a bit, so in case we get some folks to come in late, we can go ahead and accommodate them as well. So welcome to SQL Saturday, first of all, and welcome to the session. We'll talk about uh, an introduction to SQL Server Integration Services. And for today, we'll go over several things. We'll have a a definition and an overview of what ETL is. Uh, we'll talk about some of the common ETL tools in the marketplace. We'll go over uh, the SSIS specific architecture. Uh, we'll dig through at a high level and uh, discuss the logical components included with SSIS. And I noted that we have demos. Actually, we've just got, uh, since we've got so much material to talk about, we've just got one practical uh, example that I'm going to show you within SSIS. So, can everybody hear me okay, by the way, in the back? I've got some volume control, so, all right. If you can't hear me, just uh, just give me a shout. Whoops. Uh, one minor thing, I'm, uh, I'm operating in a, a different resolution here, so I don't actually have full screen capability. So, if, uh, if I jump off course, just bear with me as I, as I work through these things, which is like now. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Tim Mitchell. Uh, I've got a couple of Microsoft certifications in SQL Server. I'm also a SQL Server MVP. Uh, if you're interested, you can see my website and my blog at timmitchell.net. And for those of you who are on Twitter, who's on Twitter, by the way? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of SQL Server people on Twitter, by the way. So if it's something you're interested in, it's not just, a, not just a toy, really. It's really a good tool for getting some quick help, for providing quick help as well. So I uh, encourage you to check that out. Uh, a little more about me, I am a, a board member for the North Texas SQL Server User Group, which is the group that put on this event. So, uh, Specifically with regard to SQL Saturday, I would certainly love to hear your feedback about this event once we wrap up. Uh, session evaluations, of course, the event evaluations, we'd love to get those. But if you've got any, uh, any feedback, any specific feedback that you'd like to discuss, ideas for next time, would you plan for this thing to be a yearly event, at least a yearly event? Uh, so we'd love to get feedback, and uh, positive, negative, or otherwise. I'd certainly love to hear from you on that. Um, I'm also the interim chapter leader for the PASS BI virtual chapter. So for those who don't have PASS resources in front of them, uh, geographically or otherwise, they've created some virtual chapters where they have meetings online. It's all uh, live meeting based. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. I didn't include a link, but it's bi.sqlpass.org. And there's a variety. There's performance tuning. There's a... There's several different uh, app dev, I believe, has one as well. So, and when I'm not speaking and, uh, and doing other things in the community, I'm a full-time BI consultant with Artist Consulting. Uh, it's about a mile up the road. Uh, we, do, uh, we provide Microsoft solutions throughout the BI SQL Server stack, uh, as well as the SharePoint space, uh, starting to get into the new technologies, Power Pivot, uh, and so forth. So you know a little about me. I want to just take a quick poll and see who I've got here. So. By show of hands, who of you are DBAs or full-time database professionals? And would you classify yourselves BI professionals? Business principals? Business folks? Application developers? Okay, so lots of app devs here. Um, how many of you have no to little experience with SSIS? Okay. This presentation will be right up your alley, so we'll, we'll not dig too much into the technical details. I'm going to give you a, a high-level overview. We will look at the product, but uh, at a fairly cursory level, so I, I really want to give you an understanding of not just how SSIS does what it does, um, but how it can benefit your business, uh, how it can replace some other processes, and so forth. So just a few housekeeping things, like I said. The session evals and the event evals are critical, not just for this session, but for everybody. Um, and I mentioned during the opening session that those are anonymous. So you've got a, a number ticket within your bag. You don't put your name on your evaluation. You put the number on the evaluation. That way we get as honest a feedback as we can get. Um, speaking as a, a speaker, we don't mind the negative feedback because that gives us something to improve upon for next time. So certainly appreciate all the feedback, good and bad. 
And those are used for, for the drawings as well. Uh, be sure and stop by the sponsors. I saw that there was a huge crowd outside the, the sponsor tables earlier, so I definitely appreciate you guys stopping by and talking to them because they were the ones that made all this possible. So, what exactly is ETL? Uh, that's a term that you're going to hear floated around quite a bit. Uh, and at its core, it's simply extraction, transformation, and loading. It's taking data from one source, running it through uh, possibly multiple transformations, updating it through business rules, and so forth and then sending it out to various other sources. Uh, it's also simply a mechanism to move data between sources. Maybe there's no transformation involved. And we'll take a look at a couple of examples of that. Uh, one key component of ETL, and depending on whom you ask, this could be a best practice or worst practice, is the ability to stage data. When you're dealing with multiple systems, this is actually a, a very positive thing from an ETL design perspective because uh, if I'm dealing with a system that I only have access to at a given point in time, for example, there's a maintenance window, um, or if I'm hitting a production system, I don't necessarily want to bang on that production system time after time and run all my ETL from that production system. I want to be able to take that data out, stage it up, and then within SQL Server, relationally address that data, because that's simply that's what the, the database engine is for. So. Uh, within ETL, you'll do a lot of updates of in-flight data based on business rules. Uh, that could be minimal updates or, or even no updates in some cases to lots and lots of updates. Uh, I tell a story where we, at, at my previous employer, I worked for a hospital and we got rid of an ancient Unix-based system. Uh, they had some of the dirtiest data I've ever seen and it got their job done, but the data within the system that we were able to extract out uh, was so dirty that we ended up uh, having to apply lots and lots of business rules to it just to get it to conform uh, not only what they expected to see in the new system, but the data constraints within that new system as well. So. And then lastly, on the definition of ETL, you've got clean up or validate data. Uh, I've long, for a long time, been a proponent of expanding ETL to be uh, ETLV because there's not really, you don't really have ETL unless you've done some sort of validation process. If you simply take data from A, update it, load it to B, and don't validate your results either by row count, uh, by hash, or some other mechanism, by, at least by column totals, uh, eventually it will come back to bite you. So certainly uh, validation should be uh, a key part of any successful ETL strategy. So some common ETL scenarios that you'll run into, and I've listed those roughly in order of uh, of how often you'll occur them in the real world. And the first is, of course, data warehousing. If you do, does anybody do any data warehousing actively at all? Okay. So, data warehousing is one of the most common uses of ETL. Um, what's involved in data warehousing is simply taking data from one or more production systems, writing it out to a relational store, where from there it can either be queried on directly or integrated as part of a cube and rolled up into aggregate values and, and reported upon from there. And of course ETL is a critical part of that for a couple of reasons. First of all, you don't want to run those reports against your production system. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, EDI, or ETL rather, gives you the ability to denormalize that data. Uh, so any well-designed database is going to be highly normalized and that's the way it performs well. Uh, unfortunately, that's the inverse of what you need in, uh, in a reporting system and an analytical system. So uh, as part of your data warehousing, you'll take that data, take it out of its normal form and denormalize, denormalize it as much as possible uh, for reporting and aggregation. So, Also structured EDI, uh, and I hesitated to break that out into its own entity, but uh, what I consider structured EDI is uh, simply extracting data and sharing it out to, uh, for example, vendors. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked with a hospital uh, for several years before I took my current role. Um, and they do a lot of file-based EDI. So they would send, uh, vendors would send us files, whether it's a doctor's office or a billing company or whatnot. They send us files, we integrate those into our systems, and then in return we send them files as well. Uh, so we use some lightweight ETL processes to both generate that data to send out to those vendors as well as to process the data uh, coming in from them. Also systems integration, and you don't see this so much on its own without uh, MDM, and I'll talk about MDM in just a minute. Um, but systems integration, you see some small pocketed efforts of 
organizations that have lots of disparate data sets. So you might have a, a set of customers over here and a set of sales data over here, but they don't really talk to one another. So uh, as part of ETL, you might write the data back and forth. Uh, generally, when you're talking about production systems, you wouldn't want to do that as part of a proper ETL, but something like BizTalk or something real time that would process those messages. Uh, but I do see that every now and again where ETL is used. Lastly, uh, master data management. Has anybody done anything with master data management at all? Okay, that's, uh, that's actually more hands than what I expected to see. Um, so master data management is one of the new buzzwords. Microsoft has gotten into master data services recently uh, with, uh, I believe it's SQL Server 2008 R2. They've got some new services that will address master data management. And it takes the system, system integration point that I made a minute ago to the next level. So for example, if I've got a database that has all of my customers, I've got another database that tracks the sales data, I've got another database that is maybe my human resources data. There's a lot of commonality between all those data sets. And sometimes you'll have, you'll have the same set of data that's expected to live in each of the data sets. And I'll give you a practical example. I've worked with a client recently who has a, they call it a location master. They've got various locations throughout the world. In their sales system, they've got a list of the locations and all their identifiers. In their GL system, they've got a list of the locations and the same identifiers. Uh, over in their, uh, I believe it's their POS system, they've got all the locations and their identifiers. That's all the same data. All those locations are the same. They're going to exist across the organization. There's nothing specific about GL that says that that would hold a location. So the problem comes in if I've got for example, I need to make a change to my Dallas office. I don't need to touch one system. I need to touch three systems or four systems or five systems. That's a, a highly, highly suspect process because it relies on human intervention, relies on someone looking at that data validating that they did it right. So uh, MDM wraps that up and, and integrates that data where I have a single system of record. So. Uh, and ETL for MDM, ETL is a huge piece of that. Just because of the volume of data that you're moving around, uh, the huge level of validation that you have to do with those processes. So you'll see a lot of ETL in, in MDM structures. So way back when, uh, some, we'll talk about some of the tools of the trade. Uh, way back when, when ETL wasn't even ETL, uh, when ETL was considered just moving data around, you didn't have a lot of tools to choose from. <coughs> Most people would roll their own solution using a, a variety of unstructured tools. You'd have uh, custom scripts, uh, possibly even custom applications that were written in, uh, in compiled code. Uh, a lot of times you'd have batch files, either Windows batch files or Unix batch, batch files. Sometimes stored procedures would come into play. And certainly a lot of manual operations, a lot of copy and paste operations. And those worked well in certain situations. Of course, if you've got an organization that's sizable enough to make that investment to do all that manual work, certainly you can build out a system that has the level of tracking, the level of auditing, uh, the structure that you need to make that a successful ETL process. The problem is that uh, very often the resources weren't there to invest. So it's a matter of I need data to go from from A to staging, I need it to be updated based on some rule and then finally written out to location B. That was completely manual uh, and very labor intensive just because there's not, there wasn't a standard tool to do that. Uh, you might move the file over in uh, a transact SQL statement, for example, and then you, you make whatever modifications you need in a batch file and finally you manually FTP the file up to its final destination. Uh, so certainly there probably were some success stories with these manual methods, but it was very difficult to do, very time consuming, and very difficult to troubleshoot. So because nature abhors a vacuum, uh, and certainly the market does too, uh, some vendors came along that worked into that space and created some custom ETL tools. Uh, the two that I noted on here, there are certainly many more. These two aren't the, the only two ETL vendors, but uh, they were the ones that, uh, that are fairly standard. They're, other than SSIS, they're probably the most well-known up to this point. Uh, Informatic and DataStage, and I've never used either of those products. Um, I have worked with some folks that have. Those are excellent, excellent products. They do their jobs very well. 
Um, in fact, they've, to be honest, they've got a lot more flexibility. They've got a lot more components than SSIS. The only problem that those two guys have in common is the significant amount of resources it requires to both procure the software as well as retain the talent necessary to administer it. Um, if you're working in a, a very high-end ETL data warehouse, and that's all you do, and your, your ETL is mission critical, you're moving around petabytes of data at any given time, one of these tools may be what's best for you. But uh, just be aware that, that the entrance fee is steep, the ongoing costs are steep. Uh, so again, you get what you pay for. So in uh, SQL Server 7, and I believe it was 1997 when that came out, uh, we got a new tool called Data Transformation Services, or DTS. Lots of DTS packages floating out there. Um, it was a, a tool that was easy to, fairly easy to learn, relatively structured, and I included the, the good old General Lee because uh, DTS is a lot like the General Lee. It's fast, it gets the job done, it takes you where you need to go. There's nothing elegant about it. No creature comforts whatsoever. Uh, certainly a good tool. It was certainly a good initial release tool. Uh, it was a great freshman effort. Uh, it did leave some things to be desired. Now there were some improvements in SQL Server 2000, uh, but still there, weren't a, there wasn't a huge leap from 7 to 2000. It was relatively the same product, uh, just a few add-ons here and there. But one of the things that uh, DTS folks would complain about the most, and fortunately I did not grow up in the DTS environment. Uh, I started off in SSIS late in 2005, so fortunately I got to miss out on all but the converting of the DTS packages over to SSIS. Um, but a common theme among those who deal with DTS is that it, it lacks a lot in terms of error handling, especially uh, with logging, and a big one is custom scripting. Uh, scripting is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to get right in DTS. So, in late 2005, we got a new tool. Along with the new SQL Server stack, we got SQL Server Integration Services. And it was a completely new product. Um, I hate to go so far as to say it was a complete rewrite because I don't think it was. And if you do any low level, if you do any scripting in SSIS, for example, you'll s still see the DTS namespace splattered all over the place. So there are still some DTS underpinnings, uh, but certainly the user interface, the user experience is far better, performance is far better, uh, and, it ha and it added a number of new components that made our jobs as ETL developers easier. Uh, it is tightly integrated, not just with Visual Studio, but with the entire BI stack. Uh, so when you're dealing with, uh, when you're developing SSIS packages, you're actually working in Visual Studio. So for those of you who are working in application development or some similar role, uh, to make the leap from the software tool you're already using over into SSIS bids environment is relatively trivial because it is the same environment. You've got your debugger, uh, you've got your, your solutions organized, and you've got projects within the solutions and so forth. So fortunately, the learning curve is fairly low there. Uh, now you'll hear the term bids quite a bit, or Business Intelligence Developer Studio. Uh, you'll hear that mentioned alongside Visual Studio. Bids is Visual Studio. It's actually just a lightweight version. It doesn't have the ability to, for example, if you only install SQL Server, the bids tool that's included with that, you couldn't crack it open and write a C-sharp application. You couldn't crack it open and create a web page because it doesn't have those, those templates installed. But as far as the base language, the product features, and everything else, that's the same. So uh, the cost of entrance as far as training is relatively low. Uh, lots of improvements in error handling. Actually, you've got, uh, it's not just an error handler, but an event handler routine with an SSIS that makes handling errors, events, uh, bits of information, you can handle those straight in line. It's actually separate from your control flow and your data flow. Uh, and it's visually, it appears different from the rest of the product. Well, it, visually it's separated from the rest of the product. So uh, you can very quickly see which routines are mainstream and which are event handlers. And one thing that came along with 2005 was the separation of the control flow from the data flow. So DTS, if you ever look at a DTS package, 
you'll see that everything is dumped on one screen together. You've got your, your control, control flows, your constraints, all of your looping logic. It's all dumped into the same pane, essentially. So you've got one design surface. So the good news is you have one design surface. The bad news is you have one design surface. Because if you get a really big package, a really complex package, uh, just for the user experience, it gets difficult to administer. Because you've got so much clutter, you've got so much noise. Uh, one of the big benefits of 2005 and forward was that now those two are separate. So I've got my control flow and my data flow, and we'll discuss those and, and go over what's included in each one. Uh, but you've got your con control flow separate from your data flow, which helps to logically break out those tasks and give you a visual reminder of where you are and sort of keep everything straight in your head. And I think I just closed my presentation. There we go. Yeah, this uh, full screen thing is throwing me off just a little bit. So SQL Server 2008, of course that's still got SSIS. Wasn't, uh, it didn't include a huge amount of upgrades for SSIS with that version. Uh, there were a few small improvements. Uh, one of the most notable is improved performance. Um, now I'm speaking purely academically because I haven't benchmarked 2005 versus 2008, but uh, there was a good deal written about the engine, the SSIS engine, or the runtime, and how that addresses uh, specific applications. So if you run an SSIS package in 2005 side by side with 2008, it's purported to have better performance. But uh, again, I haven't tested that, so take that for what you will. Uh, the lookup transformation changes. So within 2005 in SSIS, the lookup transformation was, it was a good tool, but you were limited. So if I want to do a lookup to, for example, validate some lookup data, validate some reference data, uh, I was limited to doing so as an inner join operation. So if I do a lookup and there's no match found on my reference table, it by default creates an error condition. That may be what you want. In many cases, it's not. Uh, and there were workarounds, but it was difficult to do. It wasn't a native, a native function of SSIS. So 2008 gave you the ability to, on your lookup, you can actually do a lookup and say, okay, I've validated this row in the pipeline, send it off this way. But I've got another set of data that was not validated. It's not an error, it doesn't represent an error condition. I'm going to handle it with this path. And then I've got yet another set that maybe this really is an error. Maybe something happened in the lookup at data type incompatibility or something. And then I'll branch that off separately. So uh, certainly that cut down on the manual effort required for the workaround. Also, for those of you who, uh, who do write code, if you prefer C Sharp over VB.NET as I do, this was a huge improvement. Uh, SSIS 2005 did not include the ability to code in anything but VB.NET. So you could choose your language, whatever language you want, as long as it's VB.NET. Uh, the interesting thing was it had a drop down list to allow you to select which language that you wanted to code and write custom scripts in, but that was your only selection. With 2008, now you can use C Sharp. So. Uh, functionally, there's not a lot of difference. Of course, it all compiles down to the same bytecode, more or less. But if you're used to C Sharp, you don't like VB, and again, I'm in that crowd, uh, this was a big addition as well. So the cache transformation is a fun one. Um, I don't see this one used a lot. I really figured this would take off a lot more than it has. Uh, so for example, if you've got a package or a series of packages that hit the same reference data set over and over again. I mentioned the location master with the client that we had worked with. So if I've got a process that hits that location master over and over and over again to do validation, that gets expensive in terms of database resources. So ideally, I'd hit that once, queue it up, write it to either a file or in memory or something to keep that data for reference purposes and then refer to that in the future rather than going all the way back to the database server. This is now a function of SSIS 2008. So the cache transform will let me, for the first round trip to the database, I'm going to, I'm going to queue up that data. I'm going to write it to an in-memory store and keep it there. If I need to refer to that data set again, rather than saying the database is my data source for that set of data, now I hook directly to the cache transformation. Far less expensive, um, and it certainly saves cycles on ETL. One thing to note that if you're using that, uh, there is a cost associated, so you need to get the entire reference data set, put it into your in-memory storage. You need to be aware of your memory management. Uh, but if you're using relatively small reference data sets, you should be okay. 
Okay, so we went through some of the some of the process or some of the products rather that you can use for ETL. Uh, we'll jump into a little bit of architecture discussion. I won't go too deeply on that, but I'll give you an overview of what the SSIS architecture looks like. So, for installing SSIS, it is an included product with SQL Server 2005 and above. It does require either standard or enterprise edition. You can't run it on the work group or Express or whatever web version I think they've got now. Uh, it does require one of those two versions. Interestingly, you can install SSIS with or without the database engine. So even though it's part of the same installation, uh, you've probably all been through the, S or the SQL Server installation, you can select or deselect whatever components you want. SSIS is simply another component in there and you can install that with SQL Server or completely separate from SQL Server uh, and run those parallel. One thing to note from a cost perspective is that if you install an SSIS server, even absent of the database engine, it costs you a SQL Server database engine license. Uh, so if you want to put something out there, just know that even if you're using just SSIS, it does cost you in terms of licensing. Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a scenario where somebody just installed SSIS. Even if you shut off the database engine, even if you don't use it at all, shut it down or leave it up and running for staging. Uh, that's actually a good use for if your server is only serving the purpose of ETL. Keep SQL Server running, use that SQL Server instance as a staging area, and you've got a place to dump data if you need to as part of your ETL. Um, but again, I've never seen that out in the wild, so just a personal preference, but I don't want to pay for a, a SQL Server license that I'm not using. So, uh, Also one thing to note, I mentioned that it's only available on Standard or Enterprise Edition. If you are on Standard, if you're not on Enterprise, be aware that there are some components, particularly in the Data Warehouse realm, that are not available in the Standard Edition. It does require the Enterprise Edition. Uh, and I've just listed a few of them, fuzzy grouping, fuzzy lookup, uh, there, there's a dimension processing destination. Also, I believe that there's a term extraction, which will allow you to do some data profiling. That's included in that set that's only available with the Enterprise Edition. Um, honestly, I d in my uses, I don't use those a whole lot. So if you're buying a server just for ETL purposes, unless you really need to milk it for all it's worth, I think you'll be okay with, uh, in most cases, with just using the Standard Edition. So I mentioned the bids environment. Uh, this is a, just a snapshot of bids. And those of you who do any kind of application development or report development or anything will notice that it looks like the same tool you're used to using. It just got the BI templates installed. I believe we've got, uh, we've got an SSIS template package open over there. One thing to note about, there is an SSIS service that's installed. So you've got the runtime, of course, which is the, the bits on the disk. And you've got a service, a service that by default will automatically start. So if you think about this being an extension of SQL Server, if you're running SQL Server and you shut down the SQL Server service, what happens? Your phone starts to ring. Uh, the same is not really true though with SSIS. If you shut down the SSIS service, nothing really happens interestingly enough because uh, SSIS runtime is not dependent on the SSIS service. This confuses a lot of people. They think they've got to have that service running. It's got to be under a certain context, and it really doesn't. Um, that being said, I usually leave it running. I rarely see it shut off. What you get with the SSIS service is some design time integration. Uh, when you use SQL Server Management Studio, uh, you get to see, of course, the running packages, the deployed packages out on your MSDB installation or your file system. Uh, so it's not, it's not a resource hog. It's not necessarily a bad thing to have running. I think it's rare to shut it down, but uh, just know that if, uh, if you're in a situation where you think you need to bounce the SSIS service or you need to, to restart it for some reason, those are co two completely different operations. The execution of packages is not dependent upon the service. So let's work through some of the logical objects that you'll find in SSIS. And uh, even though most of you said you haven't done a lot of SSIS development, you've probably heard the term package. This is the single executable deployable unit of work that you'll encounter. Um, it's the entity that you'll work with the most when you're dealing with SSIS. Uh, and that generally encapsulates, uh, and, and we, could get, we could break off on a whole other discussion about how much stuff you put into a single SSIS package. Uh, but however you structure it, this is the, 
This is the tool that you use to deploy your logic one way or the other. Um, so depending on whom you ask, and uh, Sean McCowan, another one of our speakers today, and I, uh, we both do a lot of work in SSIS, and he and I differ on that. I think he likes to put a lot of stuff in SSIS packages. I prefer, honestly, to put less components in each SSIS package and make each one specific to one task. So if I've got, if I've got an entire ETL process, it's a rare occasion that I put all that in one package uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if I'm working in a multi-developer environment, um, I don't depend on, hey, I need the copy of the package. I can, have, I can be working on this package while another developer is working on this package and yet another one and so forth. Also, for troubleshooting purposes, a lot of times these packages are long running. They access a lot of data. It's not uncommon to have packages that run for hours at a time. If during my troubleshooting process I have, I suspect, for example, uh, my dimension processing or my dimension loading package is either failing or performing less than optimally, I don't want to have to run my entire two hour ETL process after every change to see if I fixed the problem. So when I break those out into individual units of work, I've got a smaller repeatable process that's easier to debug and it doesn't cost me as much in terms of development time. Now you could look at the flip side of that and say, well yeah, but I've got a huge ETL process and I've got, I've got these many things and if I do it that way, then I've got 50 SSIs packages that I've got to administer. I've got to deploy these things, I've got to administer, I've got to back up, I've got to make sure they're all current. And that argument could be made as well, but with my experience, I found it far preferable to use multiple packages rather than dumping everything into a single package. Yes, sir? When you compare the two methods, uh, is one better for thre multiple threads or, or another method? You know, I haven't. Uh, the question was if you compare the two methods, doing everything in one versus multiple packages, uh, with respect to threading, is one preferable over the other? I don't know that I've done any profiling on that. I can speak to performance, and I can say that when I've looked at both methods, I don't notice a huge performance sh uh, swing either way. So. Um, certainly if you had lots of packages going on, if you had lots of activity at one time, you might see some disparity one way or the other, but it's not something that I've observed. So again, that's the single deployable unit of work, um, and there's nothing magic behind the SSI's package. It's a plain old XML file. You could crack this thing open, open it up with, uh, actually within Visual Studio, you can right click the package and go to view code. Uh, you can open up your favorite XML editor or just plain old notepad and fire it up in notepad. Um, that being said, even though you can crack that open, look at it, and make edits, don't do that. Um, it's very easy. If you crack one of those open and you see the structure of it, yes, it's XML, but it's very, very bulky XML. Uh, if you do any kind of manual modification, it would be very easy to miss an angle bracket, to misplace uh, a semicolon, misplace a quote, extraneous character or something, and you could corrupt your entire package that way. So um, the resource is out there if you need to do some sort of mass update, you're looking for a particular string that you want to update rather than going through the GUI. I don't recommend this unless you really know what you're doing and of course always make a good backup. So package deployment, and this is all also another hot button question about which one do you prefer. So there's three different avenues that you can use to deploy your package. Uh, in no particular order, and I'll, I'll tell you my preference at the end, but in no particular order, the file system, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. If I want to deploy my packages to the file system, I identify a location either on my ETL server or on the network, and simply when, I, when I'm ready to deploy them out of development, I write it out to the file system. It's pretty simple as that. Next up is the package store, which is a little fancier way to do it. You're still deploying to the file system, but uh, SSIS has some awareness of those packages in the file system. Uh, to be honest, I don't know that I've ever used the package store, uh, just because it's, uh, it's just another version of the file system. And then finally, MSDB. So you can actually store, because it is simply XML, uh, it's just a, a big wide string of characters, you can actually store it in the MSDB database. Now, my preference on the three is to use MSDB, and I'll tell you why. 
if I'm a database professional and I'm working in an organization of any size, I'll have a certain group of people responsible for database management. I'll have a certain group of people responsible for file system and backup management, server management, another group, and so forth. So me as a database, sorry, me as a database professional, I've got to rely on someone else to make sure those backups are being done, that an accurate version history is being kept, uh, that I can go out and physically touch the packages. Um, and there are some limitations there in the file system because do I know if that's been backed up? When was it last backed up? What version am I on? Um, with the file system, again, any organization of any size, you may be limited there. The MSDB database is typically administered under a different group. It's under the database group, database support professionals or whatnot. So you've got the ability as a database professional or BI professional to go out and, and put your hand, so to speak, on on that copy, on that backup copy, on the current copy. Uh, you can do your own versioning. Uh, but most importantly, there's nothing that you need to do over and above what you're already doing to keep those packages secure. If you're backing up MSDB, which everybody is, right? If you're backing up MSDB, you're already backing up your SSIS packages. So that's my preference. Again, depending on whom you ask, you'll get a different opinion. Uh, but that's been my experience, that MSDB is a preferable way to store those. Uh, and again, back to your question about performance, uh, I don't know that I've ever profiled either one of these uh, deployment methods as to performance because the first thing that will happen is that it will load that package up into system memory. So it's, it's just the XML resident in memory. So uh, unless, you've got, unless you're pulling it from the file system some, from some remote office offshore, uh, you shouldn't really notice any performance implication either way. Okay, so I promised a discussion on both the control flow and the data flow. So we'll walk through those, talk about the logical components of each and uh, some common tasks that you might perform in each one. Excuse me. So the control flow, um, at the risk of being, being redundant, controls the flow of the package. It does exactly what you might expect. Generally, you find non-traditional ETL uh, within the control flow. You don't find situations where directly within this interface you're moving data from A to B. Uh, it does facilitate that, but typically you won't have a situation where just exclusively in here I'm connecting to a database and then writing out to a text file. While you can, it generally doesn't happen. So again, those non-ETL type functions, uh, interaction with the operating system, uh, FTP operations, mail operations, and things like that. We'll take a look at a, a short list of those in just a minute. Uh, one of the nice things about the control flow is that you've got the ability to do conditional execution. So if I want to conditionally execute a particular component of my package based on a variable that I'm passing in, based on some other event that occurred previously in my ETL, uh, I can do that within the control flow. So, uh, and it's actually quite easy to do. And you can see the, the example package that I've got. Um, so I've got a data flow task connecting to a script task and then a green connector going to my, my second data flow task. The green indicator tells me that that, data, that task will only be executed if the previous task was successfully executed. So go a little further down, you can see that I've got the same thing from data flow one to data flow two, but over to data flow three, I've got a red arrow. That indicates that this is where the execution will go if the previous component failed. And now there's another situation that you'll have a blue arrow where it will pass off control based on completion. So successful completion or failure completion, it will move forward. So within any of these arrows that you see, you can set an expression to define if some condition is true, go forward. Otherwise, either take another route or don't execute at all. So another strong feature within control flow is nesting. Uh, so when you start using loops, containers, and things like that, you can nest those unto, uh, I guess, infinite levels. Uh, this is good if, uh, if, again, you do go down the route of putting everything in one package. If you need to independently execute a group of packages within the designer, you can do a right click and go execute. But if you've got several that you need to execute at once as part of your testing, uh, you can't really do that in the designer unless you use some sort of container. So when you do that, you can nest those containers and you can say, 
I want this group of tasks to be able to be executed by, uh, by themselves in the designer. So the downside of that, uh, though, is of course you can only do that in the designer. If you deploy it out, uh, when you run it through your SSIS scheduler, or rather your SQL Server agent scheduler, you don't have that ability. And finally, repetition. Yes, sir? Uh, Tim, let's see if I understand. You're saying that if I'm running a package, and let's say I want to then branch out into another package, I cannot do that unless everything's in that one package. No, what I'm saying is if you've got everything dumped into a single package rather than multiple packages. Now, the thing about this, though, is with, uh, with what you're seeing here, you've got components that represent some unit of work. You can actually embed packages within packages as well. Oh, I see. So you can see that I've got data flow tasks up here, but that could be execute a package here and then execute a package here. So as part of a larger ETL strategy, once you've got your leaf-level packages developed, you could put those in here and then do your conditional execution. If this package completes, then execute this package. Otherwise, execute some other package. Oh, I see. So you don't consider that everything being in the same package? Well, it could go either way. Again, it could go either way. So, so what you're looking at here are just data flow containers and script tasks, but that could go all the way up to the package level as well. Did that answer your question? How many, I guess, uh, in terms of running these packages, Concurrently, is there some conflict if you're, if you're, for example, you're running the same type of packages which are embedded in different packages and running all of them concurrently? Is there some, some rule that, you know? So if I understand correctly, if you're running multiple packages at once, is there a, a hard stop as to how many packages I can execute in parallel? Yeah, and if they're kind of calling each other. The if they're packages. calling each other. Well, since uh, I, I think the short answer is no, because Again, when you load up a package, you're not really, you're not creating a lock on that row in MSDB. You're not saying, I have exclusive access to this package during the duration. You're going out to MSDB or the file system, give me all the metadata associated with this package, I'm going to dump it into memory. So if you've got 30 packages that, for example, you're calling them all at once based on different parameters, you're not going to end up with a database locking situation where, okay, this process has this package locked and I need to wait until it's done and so forth. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Good. So can, you can do those loops. Uh, repetition is key to saving yourself work. Uh, if you've got processes that access, for example, a different, uh, a different set of files with the same metadata, uh, perhaps even a different set of tables with, uh, with differing metadata, you might find yourself creating multiple connections over and over again. Repetition will allow you to use things like expressions, configurations, uh, and variables to cut down on those multiple objects that essentially do the same thing with slightly different settings. Um, so there's a couple of different, and we'll take a look at, uh, or we'll talk over in just a minute, the two different types of loops that are available within SSIS. So what we were looking at before was several different data flow tasks. So a data flow task encapsulates uh, everything that you'll see in the data flow on the data flow tab in just a minute. We'll hop over there in just a second. Uh, you can have multiple data flow tasks in any one control pane or any one package or none. Uh, I have seen some ETL processes that, uh, that call out exactly zero database processes, uh, interestingly enough, just because all the logic is there to, uh, to make, I'll give you a practical example of that. Uh, so we had a process where we were going out retrieving web log, database web log file, I'm sorry, uh, website log files, <coughs> pulling those down locally. We had a Perl application that had to run on those daily and process the metadata, process the, the web statistics, and then write that out to another location. Uh, we had a couple of homegrown solutions that were patched together to do that, but it was there were two different interfaces that we had to use and there was some scripting involved. So. We integrated all that within SSIS and did it all within, uh, within the control flow of SSIS, even though we weren't connecting to any database and we weren't doing any proper ETL. Um, is that what SSIS was designed for? Probably not, uh, but it was one single interface, one very easy to use interface that would do everything we needed to do for that process. So don't think that you've got to use just moving data from database to file, database to database, file to database. 
that those are your ETL operations. There are some other things that you can do uh, that aren't typical ETL uh, and leverage the power of SSIS as well. So again, the data flow task is basically a container that contains your connections, your sources, and your destinations, and all your transformations. The file system task will allow you to, uh, just like the name implies, interact with the file system. I can read files, I can create files, copy files, delete files, uh, mark files as archive, and so forth. This is very handy if you're dealing with file-based ETL and you need to do some file archiving, for example, if I receive a set of files every day, I want to, once I process them, I want to put them off into a process directory. The file system task is very good for something like that. <laughs> FTP task is a, a moderately useful component. Uh, if you're connecting to a flat, clear text FTP server, it works very well. Uh, if you don't have any advanced configurations, it works very well. The minute you need to connect to a secure FTP server, you're out of luck unfortunately, because it doesn't support any version of secure FTP. Um, I'd really hope that we'd see a secure FTP task in either SQL Server 2008 or the R2 edition, um, but both of those were bypassed, unfortunately. There are some third-party tools that will do that for you, or you can, uh, if you're really brave, you can roll your own. Uh, but just know that if you need to connect to a secure FTP server, and hopefully everybody's got secure FTP servers if you've got data of, uh, uh, of any value to you. Uh, you're using secure FTP. Just know you can't go into SSIS and just drag across the FTP task and force it to work. It won't work securely. Also, I mentioned the loop and the sequence containers. Uh, and I'll start with the sequence container because that's, uh, that's the least complicated of the two. A sequence container is simply a place to store stuff within your control flow. So think of it as a smaller version of the control flow. So when you dump something into the sequence container by default, everything in that sequence container will execute at the same time. It will execute in parallel. Uh, now we mentioned the precedence constraints and creating the arrows between those components. So you can set a, or, an order of operations uh, and set which packages or which components will be executed in what order. Uh, but the sequence container is good for those if you want to do a, a right click, execute everything in this sequence container. It works very well for that. Also the looping. Uh, there's two different loop containers. There's the for loop container and the for each loop container. Uh, the for loop container will continue to loop until a certain condition is met. The for each loop container will execute once for every item provided as a list of enumerators. And you've got a couple of options. You can enumerate through uh, a list of files in a file system, uh, nodes in an XML file. Uh, you can actually go down if you're uh, comfortable with scripting you can create an ADO.NET data set and iterate through all the objects in there as well. You can also create your own custom list of objects, but I, I encourage you not to do that in most cases just because you're embedding business logic within your SSIS package, and typically that's better externalized. And also the precedence constraint. We took a, a quick look at those. So the red, blue, and green arrows that we looked at, those are precedence constraints. Uh, you can further exploit those by attaching uh, SSIS expressions to them. Uh, use your conditional execution. I want this to execute only if a condition is true. Um, and you can do that through a, a fairly simple expression within your precedence constraint. All right, so dipping down into the data flow. This is where you find your direct ETL operations. You're connecting to a data source, you're performing zero or more transformations, and then you're writing it out to some other data, uh, some data destination. This is where you'll see the bulk of your activity in any sizable ETL <coughs> process. Um, and I'll go through those entities really quickly. I think we're running a little short on time. Thanks, Roy. Uh, so the data, we've got data connections. That should be at the top. The data connection is the connection to some data source. It could be a connection to a file, a connection to an Excel file, uh, of course, connection to a database of various types, SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, uh, whatever the case may be. Data connections are reused throughout the life cycle, so you don't need a source connection and a destination connection. You have one connection that can be used for either one, unless you need different authentication. So if I've got a login for retrieving data, I've got a different login for writing data, you might have two different data connections, but in, one, in most cases, you're just going to have one. 
So the data sources are what they sound like. It's a, a connection to, or a, an attachment to a connection that will allow you to retrieve data from that connection. Um, and you've got a variety of options there. Of course, flat files, Excel files, uh, if you're into that kind of thing, access. Um, of course, databases, uh, a variety of databases. And there are some third-party providers as well. Uh, in fact, I, I had to access the Oracle provider just the other day. Um, SQL Server does give you a few of the external database drivers, but if you want the optimized provider, you'll have to get it from the provider itself, whether it's Oracle, Teradata, DB2, or whatever. So you'll also find your transformations in here. Uh, transformations can be represented in a number of ways. Uh, the most common one probably that you'll see is uh, uh, the ones that will take your data and perform some incremental, uh, some incremental change on it. Um, you can get really complex with your transformations. Actually, you can create a script that will act as a transformation. The scripting transformations are really powerful. They can also be really complex. So uh, for those of you who are app devs and you're comfortable writing code, I'm doing a, an SSI scripting presentation this afternoon. So. Uh, if you want to learn a little more about SSI scripting and as far as transformations, uh, certainly come by and see that. Also, conditional splits within your data flow. You can branch data out. This is a really cool feature, actually. You can branch your data out and apply different transformations based on some binary value or some uh, Boolean value. Uh, so, for example, if you've got different sales regions and within your ETL you want to handle those different sales regions differently within your ETL, apply different metrics to them and so forth, you use a conditional split, branch out your data flows and then bring those back together at the end. And then finally the lookups. I talked a little about the lookups just a little bit earlier. Uh, so the lookups will allow you to do validation of data. Uh, it can behave as a left join or an inner join. So you can pick up additional values from your lookup table if you so choose. Or if you get a failed lookup, you can simply mark that as, hey, this is still going to be in the pipeline, but it wasn't validated. So mark it as suspect or whatever your business processes dictate. So the common components of the data flow, uh, actually, I think I've got, uh, got the wrong title on that. Uh, so what you'll see in the data flow is uh, you've got, sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that title came from. Uh, so the multiple sources and destinations, uh, again, we talked a little bit about that. You can have uh, various connections to data files, to Excel files, databases. Uh, the lookup transformation, we went over that very briefly. Derived column transformation is one of the most common that you'll see. It just simply allows you to update a uh, value within your data flow. So you'll see that quite a bit. You can update multiple columns per uh, per derived column transformation, so you don't have to create multiple instances of that. Uh, again, we talked about the conditional split. The union all will allow you to merge data sets back together. So if you've got a conditional split, you're branching out, doing disparate processing, use the union all to bring those back together. And then finally, the row count transformation is what we talked about with validation. Uh, you can do row count validation to make sure that your rows in equals your rows out. Hopefully that's, not, whoops, hopefully that's not your only validation process, uh, but it is there. So the event handler, very quickly, uh, I mentioned that event and error handling is greatly improved in SSIS over DTS. You've actually got a separate design surface altogether to do your, uh, your event handling. And you see that there. It looks just like a control flow. Uh, you can drop in the same components that you find on the control flow under this surface. So you can send email, uh, you can write data, for example, if you find an error in staging, uh, that goes over to your event handler. You can take that stage data and process it differently if you do encounter an error situation. And then variables, uh, just like programming variables, they're simply placeholders for values. Uh, you can update them either at design time or runtime, And you can also use external configurations to update those values. Uh, configurations are really outside the scope of an entry level, but, uh, but there's quite a lot written about configurations. And if you're interested in large-scale ETL deployment, I would encourage you. Thanks, Ray. <coughs> so I mentioned expressions a couple of times. Expressions are found throughout SSIS. You can update almost any value at runtime using an expression. Uh, why would you want to use expressions if you've got some sort of 
conditional execution, again, for your precedence constraints, I want package X to be executed. If this is true, otherwise execute package Y. Uh, you can update values based on, uh, based on various conditions. Uh, but I would advise you, if you're interested in SSIs, get to know your expressions because you'll see that you'll see that quite a bit. The syntax is quirky. It looks a little like Transact SQL. It looks a little like C Sharp. Uh, it's not the whole of both, so it takes a little while to get used to that. And I mentioned the SSIs expression language. Uh, there are some resources actually out on SQLblog.com. Look up some information by a guy named Andy Leonard wrote an excellent series on using SSIS expressions. So, well, I plan to take you through a walk of the product. I apologize, we ran just a little bit long on time. Uh, but I hope that we've given you a, a good idea of the overview of SSIS, what ETL is, and how you can leverage SSIS within your ETL framework. So, uh, any questions, feel free to ping me. I'll leave some of my business cards up here. Uh, please turn in your event evaluations as well as your session evaluations. Uh, we'd love to get that feedback. And thanks for coming to SQL Saturday. Hope to see you guys at my 2.30 session. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Do you rely on uh, SSIS to help you with debugging, or do you use a third-party tool? So I've uh, I didn't even get into logging, but I, I wanted to talk a little about logging, but I, I just couldn't find time. Um, so I like to log things out to a custom log provider that I've written. Uh, that gives me the ability to do a little better debugging than what SSIS provides. If you use native SSIS debugging yeah, and, so. and logging, it's good, but you're drinking from fire. Yeah. It's just a lot of information. Right, right. So. And it's yeah. Did you stop? Oh, no, thank you. How you doing? All right. What's the ETL again? Extract, transformation, and load. So, in fact, these presentations will be available, and I failed to mention that, uh -huh. on the SQL Saturday website. We'll have those so, uploaded. So, yeah. Yeah, and on my website as well, timmitchell.net, okay. I'll have that available for download as well. Access can be a little funny to work with just because the syntactical differences in, in querying it. Uh, but actually, SSIS makes it a little easier because it does have a native connection to Access. It uses the Jet Driver, which is the same one you use when you're you're opening Excel or whatnot. Um, so there aren't really any minefields other than just making the leap from Access over to SQL Server. Certainly, so there's some quirks and data types and things like that, that you'll have to address. But SSIS handles that pretty well. Okay. So it shouldn't be a big deal. Well, it'll certainly take some time. Absolutely, I don't think you'll be able to just simply connect to Access, connect to SQL, and, and move it across, and you're good. Uh, but it's it's less problematic than say Excel. Excel is really really quirky in SSIS. So, yeah, I think you can get there. Yeah, actually, they they're all gone, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Better put them all out there. Uh, yeah, I don't think I stopped this one. Where's my Recording widget. F10 will stop it. F10?